All right. Um, by my time, it says 3.30, so we'll get started right on time. Um, thank you all for joining us today for HMSC's research seminar. My name is Cinnamon Moffitt, and I'm the research program manager at Oregon State University's Hatfield Marine Science Center, located in Newport, Oregon, and I will be your host for today. A couple of logistics before we get started. You might have noticed, but we have your mics, cameras, and screen shares turned off, and we ask that you keep them that way for the duration of this talk. But we do hope that you um, interact with us using chat. Um, and our speaker today is asking that you put in uh, your questions whenever they come to you and we'll ask them on the spot. So please um, use the chat function to interact with us and ask those questions. Depending on your platform, you can find the chat call up button either at the top or the bottom of your screen. You click on it, you'll get a little pop up box and you'll be able to uh, ask your questions there. Um, we are recording this event, so just letting folks know. Um, usually I'm able to get that recording up on the past HMSC seminar page in a few days. So I just put that link into the chat. So if you miss something or you would like to share this seminar with um, anybody who was unable to join us today, you'll be able to find it at that link in a couple of days. A um, couple of really quick announcements before we get started. I wanted to just let folks know that next week um, we have our next Science on Tap. So on Wednesday, March 10th, Jack, Jack Barth will be um, from the Marine Studies Initiative at Oregon State University is going to be giving a really interesting talk um, called The Western Flyer Rises Again. And he'll be talking about the restoration effort of the iconic vessel from John Steinbeck's book, the log of the Sea of Cortez. So I'm really excited to see um, and hear how that vessel is um, maybe coming back to our coastal waters soon. Um, I also wanted to do a little um, promo for next week's seminar. So same time, same place, but um, next week we have Zoe Almada, um, which is a new postdoc scholar for Coombs. Um, at Oregon State University, who will be talking about her PhD work on the legacy of early life ex experiences on individuals, cohorts, populations, um, and their performance of the Lake Erie walleye. So a little different for us here, but I'm excited to um, hear Zoe and make her feel welcome in our community. Um, if you need to hear or learn any details about any of our upcoming events, if you Google or use whatever platform you use and search for HMSC, Scroll to the bottom of our landing page, you will find a calendar of events there, um, and you'll get all the login details that you need to join us for any of your events. But why we're all here today, um, we have uh, Stephen Fussell here to talk to us about acidification of Pacific Northwest estuaries. But before I let him have the floor, a little bit of background on Stephen. I just learned he's been around Hatfield a lot longer than I realized, so I'm excited to have him speak with us at a seminar. Um, Stephen is an ecologist with EPA's Office of Research and Development based here in Newport, Oregon. He earned both his master's and his PhD degree from Oregon State University, which focused on the development methods for investigating coastal ecosystems, carbon cycling, and human impacts on estuary biochemistry. Um, and his current research incorporates um, field-based campaigns, uh, autonomous monitoring methods, analytical chemi chemical methods and biochemical modeling to investigate natural anthropogenic drivers of coastal acidification and hypoxia, which is what he's gonna to talk to us about today. So Steve, the floor is yours, take it away. Great, can you hear me all right? Yes, we can hear okay. you just fine. Great, thanks very much. Um, yeah, I really appreciate the invite to come and, and speak today. Um, I feel like some of us at EPA maybe don't do this enough, so. I'm glad to be able to have the audience to speak to. Um, so I'm gonna take the opportunity given that to try to talk a little bit more broadly about uh, acidification and estuaries in our part of the world here and some of the work that we're doing at the Pacific Coastal Ecology branch of EPA here at Hatfield. Um, so I'm gonna do that by starting with just sort of a conceptual background about some coastal acidification processes that are important in estuaries generally and then use two case studies from um, some of my dissertation work and some ongoing work as well that look at the interactions of, of local processes with global processes to control rates of acidification um, in estuaries. So the first one we'll look at the interactions between ecosystem metabolism and ocean acidification um, in Puget Sound, Washington. The second one we'll look at interactions between land use and eutrophication and ocean acidification in Tillamook Estuary here in Oregon. 
And then uh, if I have time at the end, I'll try to talk a little bit about some um, very new and ongoing work that we're also doing. Uh, and so with that, um, so any talk about ocean acidification, I feel like we have to talk about the global carbon cycle. So this is a great figure from the Global Carbon Project that looks at the, the perturbation of the global carbon cycle because of human activity. So the important arrows here are this fossil CO2 arrow. So this represents the burning of, of fossil fuels and the emitted CO2 because of, of human activities. So this is, of course, increasing the atmospheric CO2 levels. And uh, the other arrow we'll talk about a lot today is this arrow pointing into the ocean. So about a quarter of the, the CO2 emitted by human activities ends up being absorbed by the ocean. And that enters the Oceanic Dissolved Inorganic Carbon Pool or DIC pool. That's something you'll hear me talk about uh, quite a bit today. So these processes are uh, observable. So this is the, the station Mauna Loa uh, atmospheric CO2 record shown here in red. So this is the rise in atmos atmospheric CO2 since the 1950s. You can also see here the rise in oceanic CO2 content plotted in green. So as atmospheric CO2 is rising, the ocean absorb is absorbing some fraction of that, and you can, you can see um, that concurrent rise in oceanic CO2. So as CO2 is being um, absorbed by uh, the ocean, it goes through a series of dissociation reactions, and it ends up decreasing uh, the pH of the ocean, and that is plotted here in blue. So you can see as the oceanic CO2 content is increasing, the oceanic pH is decreasing. And so this process whereby the ocean is, is absorbing this anthropogenic carbon and, and with a resultant decrease in pH, that is what we are commonly uh, calling ocean acidification. So I'm here to, though to talk about ocean acidification and estuaries. And so I wanna contrast the, the difference sort of between the acidification that, that's being experienced in the ocean and that happening in, in our coast, along our coastlines. So on the left here is a two time series of open ocean pH um, uh, along uh, for about one month. So this is 30 days along the X axis. And you can see that there's not much variability in uh, oceanic open ocean pH. Whereas if you look for the same time period and the, on the same pH scale and you look at in the coastal zone, you can see that there's quite a bit of variability with regards to pH, both on really short time scales, daily time scales, sub daily time scales, and longer sort of event based time scales. So this is being driven by the many different natural and anthropogenic drivers of pH in estuaries. And this is these sorts of time series and this dynamicism in coastal environments. The story is, is much the same when you start to look at longer term pH trends in these environments. If you look at pH trends in uh, an open ocean environment, so this is in the North Atlantic uh, from the Bermuda Atlantic time series, this is looking at the decrease in pH since the mid 1980s. So you can see that there's this pretty steady decline in pH. The trend is quite easy to see in the data. Um, but then if you were to look at comparably long time series from coastal and estuarine environments around the world, which is shown here on the bottom right, you can see that the longer term pH trends in those sorts of environments are, are quite variable. Um, some are decreasing, some are increasing. Most of them show just quite a bit of variability on many different time scales. And so again, this is reflective of, of the many different processes that are important in controlling uh, coastal and estuarine pH. And the fact that these are also often operating on, on at rates that, that far exceed what's experienced in the open ocean. So this is a real challenge for those of us who are trying to understand the, the impact of acidification in coastal environments. It requires us to try to understand and tease apart the natural anthropogenic components of this, which as usual is not so easy whenever these are what your series uh, look like. So this that control the, the pH of estuaries. Some natural uh, drivers of pH in, in estuaries are river and coastal ocean mixing, uh, biological metabolism, th so through photosynthesis and respiration that takes up and releases uh, metabolic CO2, which has a very strong control on pH. Uh, gas exchange of CO2 across the air-sea interface will have a strong um, impact on pH. 
as well as calcium carbonate cycling and other uh, benthic biogeochemical processes. So the anthropogenic drivers in, of coastal acidification are often just uh, human perturbations of these natural cycles. So things like changing precipitation can alter the river discharge, water fluxes to, to estuaries and have a very strong control on the chemistry. Also altered ocean patterns can change the, the biogeochemical signatures of the ocean end members that ultimately are feeding uh, estuarine waters. You can have altered riverine delivery of carbon trance uh, and other chemical constituents that control pH that can be a result of, of land use, things like um, agricultural land use, urbanization, point and non-point runoff. And then you can also have enhanced organic matter production and respiration. So via altered delivery often of nutrients and organic matter, uh, you can change the, the net metabolism directly in estuarine environments and that can result in variability on short and longer time. Time scale. And then finally, the anthropogenic CO2 emissions uptake directly by estuaries. So as atmospheric CO2 is increasing, that's altering the air CP CO2 gradient. And so that's going to alter gas exchange fluxes. So regardless of whether an estuary is a net source or sink of CO2, that gas exchange flux is going to be altered because of the rising atmospheric CO2. And so ultimately, estuarine and waters are either going to be absorbing more carbon or retaining more carbon than they would be otherwise. So why are we conducting this research? So we know that the impacts of acidification are already being felt by, by shellfish industries on this coast and on the Atlantic coast. We also know through a variety of different um, studies that eutrophication elevates the risk of acidification and hypoxia in estuaries. So there's this need to try to characterize the role of these more local sources of acidification, things like um, eutrophication, altered land use practices, changing alterations in, in river delivery of, of different chemical constituents. To try to understand how does that interact with the baseline rising CO2 levels um, in these habitats. There's also the management and communicated via a variety of different uh, state tasks. field where often uh, lower pH conditions, higher CO2 conditions can make uh, it more difficult for organisms to grow and develop properly, especially biocalcifying organisms. And two examples here just show that uh, acidification can affect the, the earth development and bivalve larvae, as well as cause dilution in, in pteropods in the ocean. I also want to point out this figure from this uh, great paper that looked at the, the vulnerability of U.S. shell fisheries to ocean acidification. So what this figure is addressing with these, these boxes are the, the gaps in knowledge that are related to the vulnerability of our coasts to acidification. Authors point out that one of the, the, the biggest gaps and, and one that's most difficult to fill is, is this question of how does atmospheric CO2 driven OA accumulate with local drivers? And so that's really what I'm gonna be addressing today in the talk and what a lot of our research at PCEB is focused on from the acidification perspective is how do, how do local drivers um, interact with uh, the global atmospheric CO2 increase? So what we're doing now and have been doing at, the, at PCEB is, is this acidification work to try to distinguish between the human and natural drivers of acidification in coastal environments, specifically to try to look at land-based sources of acidification. Again, how are those interacting with the global OA signal? We do that via a variety of different uh, techniques. So we, we have quite a few different, um, we go and field quite a bit and directly take water samples via water quality cruises. Uh, we also have autonomous sensors that we put out to start to do some, some monitoring of water chemistry, including pH and CO2 to be able to, to get a sort of a more robust uh, data set from these, from these systems and, and it makes it uh, enhances our ability to start teasing out some of the drivers. We also have some pretty great analytical facilities here at Hatfield, as well as um, mesocosm facilities to actually carry out experiments to try to understand um, the effects of acidification on, on estuarine communities and vice versa. So it's sort of the take home is we're, we're trying to really tease apart these natural drivers and estuaries, and we're move, definitely moving towards investigating the biological and ecological impacts of these changes uh, in water quality. 
So the first case study I'm going to talk about today is this interaction between ecosystem metabolism and OA, and I'll use some work from uh, Puget Sound, Washington that was in my uh, dissertation. So this project, uh, the field portion of it at least, was carried out in 2015 and 2016. And the point of this study was to try to understand the acidification dynamics specifically in near shore shallow habitats that we know are really ecologically important for estuarine species. So a lot of the OA work, at least up until this point when we, when we started this was a, a lot of what we knew came from studies that either looked at longer time scales or were looking um, not necessarily in, in these shallow, really um, ecologically rich habitats. So that was sort of the goal and the defining feature of this was to really look at how do we think OA is manifesting in these shallow metabolically intensive habitats that are really important to, to many vital species for, for estuaries? And how is that happening on time scales that we know are relevant for, for those organism in, organisms' um, growth and development? So for the study, we chose two study sites in shallow seagrass beds here in Whidbey Basin, a Puget Island study site and the Mission Beach study site which were near uh, the mouth of the Snohomish River. We put out water quality sensors to actually monitor the chemistry at these two sites for approximately a year. We also went out on uh, a series of cruises to go take water samples at these sites to do a better job of characterizing the two chemistry as well as a variety of different nutrients and isotopic, um, isotopic variables. We also had two sites that we, we characterized um, in order to get an idea of what we thought the, the river and the marine end members were uh, to these sites. So this is an example of some of the, the data, the continuous data from these two sites. So by column, so this is looking at pH, this is looking at omega. Uh, if you're not familiar with omega already, for the purposes of this talk, all you really need to know is that it's an indicator of the relative favorability of waters for biocalcification. So the higher the value of omega, the more favorable those waters are going to be for a biocalcifier like, like shellfish. Whereas when it uh, uh, decreases, um, that's when things can become um, more difficult for, uh, for biocalcification. Uh, the, these plots are from the two different study sites, the Hat Island site on the top and this Mission Beach site on, on the bottom. The, really, the, the reason I'm showing you this and the point I want to make is that if you look at the actual observations, which are in black for all four panels, there's a lot of variability in the chemistry here. And that variability is, is, is happening on really short time scales, so sub daily time scales as well as scales. If you look at the X axis, we're moving from the summer 2015, fall, winter into the spring of 2016. So the dry season in these habitats, in these sea beds, are characterized by this incredibly chemistry and the pH is relatively elevated compared to these sites to look like based on conservative mixing alone. So lines represent what the chemistry would be expected to be in these habitats if it was just mixing between the river and the, and the marine end members and you didn't have any sort of local carbon cycling. So the habitats themselves are, are a significant modulator of the chemistry they are experiencing. When you uh, plot the pH in, in both sites against the AOU, so apparent oxygen utilization, you see uh, uh, significant correlations between the two. And that's usually indicative of habitats in which metabolism is a, is a dominant controller of pH and CO2 dynamics in the habitat. And that's not necessarily very surprising, right? Again, these uh, C that are quite reductive. So it would make sense that the metabolism is a driver of chemistry there. And in fact, we built a mechanistic model that actually tried to tease out the role of metabolism and then some other drivers in the, in the habitat and found that, in, that the, the net community metabolism cycling of carbon was by far the most important uh, mechanism um, for the actual observed variability of pH and CO2 in these habitats. So Steve, we have a question in the chat. Um, so with observation, and the, the goal was to try to understand the influence in this habitat. Sure. Sorry. Um, so a question in the chat is, um, we're on the last slide. Were, the, were these coupled with CTDs to know about tides and currents um, to evaluate the sub-daily response? 
so the um both sites had a, a YSI sawn, so we were able to track water depth, salinity, temperature changes. We did not have any sort of current meter. Great, thank you very if much. That answers the question. Okay. So uh, we again use that data to understand how would how is the signal uh, meant in these um, these time series of of pH and CO two. So we estimated the impact of acidification using a novel adaptation of already existing methods for estimating uh, anthropogenic carbon concentrations in the open ocean. And the novel portion of this is the fact that we, were, we, we implemented these methods and also maintained this observed uh, community metabolism signal. So based on our observations and modeling, we knew that a lot of the dynamics of pH were already being driven by that local metabolism. So we wanted to retain that carbon cycling signal and then just ask the question of what would this have, what would the chemistry in the habitat look like if um, it was operating on an increasing background of CO2, again, because of, because of rising atmospheric CO2 levels. So this is a plot showing um, the pH in the habitat through time. So this is from 1765 out to end of century. This, this is assuming uh, business as usual scenario. Uh, won't explain everything going on here, but just the median uh, pH is plotted with this dashed line. So you can see through time, of course, with acidification, the median pH decreases. This is um, about present day here. But I think the more interesting questions here to ask were sort of the, um, again, these shorter time scales, these, these daily, weekly time scales that we think important, especially for development of, of juvenile organisms. And so in this plot, what I'm showing is the cumulative percent change of some average daily indices from uh, the beginning of the century, I'm sorry, from pre-industrial to, to end of century. Looking at average, or sorry, median daily pH, mean daily omega and mean daily PCO2 and how much they are changing. And then what we also looked at are the extremes. So we looked at the, the, um, the average minimum pH each day, the average minimum omega, the average maximum PCO2. And we looked at those because we know that those have been demonstrated to be harmful for organisms in laboratory experiments. So the uh, chemically most difficult for, for organisms. And what we found is that when you look at the extremes relative to the averages for each of these metrics, the extremes are actually uh, predicted to be changing um, uh, much more than the median, sometimes up to twice as much um, as the medians. And so what's happening here is that with increasing acidification and those increasing background CO2 levels, it's reducing the, the buffering capacity of the waters in these habitats to buffer against the metabolically induced uh, carbon cycling. So for the same amount of metabolic carbon cycling each day, you end up having a much larger response in pH and a much larger response in CO2 because of that, this, decreasing in the buffer, this decrease in the buffering capacity of these systems. So ultimately what that means is that these extreme high CO2, low, low pH conditions are the ones that are changing most rapidly. So these, these, these times where the water chemistry is least favorable for organism growth and development, those are the ones that we expect to be, to be um, evolving most rapidly with ongoing acidification. So this is a sort of an idealized figure to try to demonstrate what this sort of looks like. This is a, a diol pH curve. Again, this is idealized, but is based on actual model data. So this is looking at the uh, average, or sorry, median daily pH in the pre-industrial scenario based on our modeling, and then the 24-hour max and 24-hour minimum. So again, this is the pre-industrial. If we look at our present-day observations, this is what things actually look like right now. So the models predict that uh, we've ex the habitats have experienced a little bit more than a tenth of a pH unit decline because of acidification. But this 24-hour um, minimum pH level has decreased more than the median. So again, these times with, of low pH, often when you have this, this uh, addition of the metabolic carbon and the anthropogenic carbon, that's when you see these conditions changing more. And finally, we can look at end of, end of century scenario, which really accentuates that issue. So again, always see a decrease in pH with ongoing acidification. 
but the time of, of day that are, are typified by the, the already um, naturally low pHs are the ones that are changing the most rapidly here. So organisms in these sorts of habitats, not only are they going to be expected to experience these changes in baseline pH, changes in baseline CO2 and, and omega, but they're also going to be experiencing more variability here. And so this is um, definitely, an, uh, I think, a really important question right now in the, the experimental community of not just evaluating what is the impact of changing baselines uh, on organisms with regards to acidification, but also what is the effect of variability? Does Do these daytime maximums, does that provide enough of a refuge for organisms to, to have a sort of a compensatory growth um, uh, mechanism, or are these enhanced extremes uh, end up being very important? So uh, interested to see how this literature continues to evolve um, based on these, these projections. So the key takeaways from this is that the, there's this prefer preferential amplification of these extreme conditions with ongoing acidification. So it's happening on these short daily time scales, but we also think that this is happening on seasonal time scales. This is based on other analyses that I'm not presenting right now, but we've, we've, uh, we've done using um, similar data and similar methods. It, it also is starting to come out that there's many other um, studies who are looking at similar dynamics and are finding the same thing. And this is coming from, from um, much more, um, from, from much larger models that are, that have much more power than the ones that I've been working with, as well as some observational studies where uh, some coastal and open ocean studies are starting to both predict as well as observe enhanced seasonality of uh, carbonate chemistry. So again, it's, this, it's likely that, that this enhanced, not, this enhanced variability of CO2 chemistry in habitats is, is going to be a feature of ongoing acidification in our oceans. But um, the point I would like to, to have you leave with is that because of the way estuaries are, because of their natural buffering capacity, or rather lack thereof compared to oceans, as well as the naturally dynamic chemistry they have, the really, really um, uh, vigorous metabolic cycling that happens, it means that these habitats are likely the ones that are going to be experiencing the most extreme changes with regards to the variability. And so those changes, again, this, it means that the, 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 the rates of acidification are non-uniform and estuaries, both in space and time. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in the next section too, but it ends up creating these hot spots for exceedances of organismal thresholds. And so it seems likely that uh, the overlap between these acidification hotspots, the times and the places where the, the chemistry is really being enhanced uh, is for, with regards to the really high CO2 conditions and the low pH conditions. The overlap of those times and places with organismal phenology is probably going to be a really important driver of the actual ecological impacts to acidification. So I, I look forward to how that um, can be integrated into um, ongoing experiments and models to try to understand what the role of this increasingly variable chemistry and, and accelerating extremes are on populations and uh, ecosystem food web dynamics. So the next case study, I want to look at, again, another local driver here and how that interacts with, with OA, and that's to look at the role of, of land use and eutrophication uh, in Tillamook Estuary, so just here in Oregon. So this was part of a, a much larger study uh, that EPA has been carrying out, and I'll present some of the results from the acidification portion of that. So if you're not already familiar with Tillamook Bay, um, so it's this open coast estuary on the northern coast of Oregon. So it's, it's highly connected to the coastal ocean via this inlet, but it's a relatively shallow bay with a really large tidal prism. So the, the residence time is pretty short. And so the chemical conditions in the bay are actually very, very uh, influenced by what's going on uh, in the coastal ocean. There's also five major rivers that drain into Tillamook Bay. Four of those enter sort of in the south, south, southeast portion of the bay. And those four rivers also pass through this area of, of anthropogenic land use. So this area down here is, is heavily utilized for dairy farming and agriculture. And then also the, uh, the town of Tillamook is located down here as well. So um, this is a really interesting system to study uh, coastal acidification because 
you have an estuary here that is highly connected to a coastal ocean that experiences seasonal upwelling. So during the, the, the dry season, the summer season, when we have um, upwelling favorable winds, that brings up high CO2 waters that enter the estuary. So um, the estuary, again, is exposed to these sort of naturally high CO2, low pH conditions from the ocean side. And then from the watershed side, you have this, this human land use dynamic. Uh, and we wanted to try to understand, um, can we quantify how these end members are changing in the ocean and the watershed? And can we try to, to understand what does that mean for chemistry in Tillamook Bay? So to do this, we established two water quality monitoring stations, uh, one at the northern end of the bay. So this picture here is looking to the, to the south. So this is the ocean on the right. So one at the northern end of the bay at the Garibaldi dock, and then one at the southern end of the bay, which is much more river influenced. In addition to those two continuous monitoring stations, we also carried out a series of synoptic samplings of the bay, as well as the rivers entering uh, the bay. Uh, on days where the, the, base, the bay team was actually sampling at these, these uh, nine different stations in the bay, a separate team was concurrently sampling in the watershed um, each of the five rivers that are entering the bay. And the sampling scheme was set up so that we tried to locate the, the sampling stations on the rivers so that we had an upstream station and a downstream station. And the idea is that the upstream station would be above most of the agricultural, or I'm sorry, human land use uh, influence. And then the downstream station would be cl much closer to the estuary and in and amongst that, that human land use. So we could try to evaluate how does river water quality entering Tillamook Bay change as these rivers traverse through um, these areas of, of, um, of anthropogenic land use. And again, overall goal here being to try to characterize the acidification dynamics in the estuary. So this is just an example of the, the water quality monitoring uh, sensors we have up at the northern end of the bay here. We have had a, either a CFET or a CFOX pH sensor operating as well as a YSI, or I'm sorry, a SAMI CO2 sensor and a YSI sonde. At the southern end of the bay, we have had um, just a YSI sonde running. Those have been going since uh, we started the project in 2017. Uh, we continue to operate the Garibaldi dock um, monitoring. We had to discontinue the southern end monitoring at the, at the beginning of the, of the pandemic because of, of logistical reasons. Um, and hopefully I'll be able to come back and talk about this a little bit at the end of the talk. So this is looking at time series from both water quality stations. So the Garibaldi dock here is plotted in all these panels in black. The southern station uh, is plotted in blue. And then the actual uh, grab samples we took from our synoptic samplings in the estuary are plotted with these red Xs. And what I want to point out here in these plots is that the, the northern station, the Garibaldi dock station, is characterized by much higher salinities as much more ocean influence, which is, of course, not surprising. It's, it's very close to the, the inlet. Whereas the Southern Station has much lower salinities on average. And especially during the wet season, we see quite low salinities and a lot of river influence uh, at this station. The Northern Station is characterized by uh, generally much higher pH and much lower CO2 levels as compared to the Southern Station, which is usually much lower in pH and much higher in CO2 levels. Again, that's mostly being driven by the exposure of the Southern site to this, these river discharges and the, the typically lower pH, higher CO2 waters, uh, higher PCO2 waters of rivers as compared to the ocean. So now I'm going to talk about some of our watershed sampling and how I have it set up here is I've plotted the stations that are our upriver stations in blue and the downriver stations here in red. And I'm really just going to focus on these four lower rivers here, the Kilchis, the Wilson, the Trask, and the Tillamook. These are the rivers that actually pass through this lower portion of the watershed that is dominated by, by human land use. And so each of these rivers, again, has this upstream station in blue and downstream station in red. This figure here plots the, the DIC level, so the dissolved inorganic carbon levels, at each of these stations through time. They're color-coded, again, by the station. And each of the sets of points represents one of our synoptic surveys. So this is going from summer 2017 to summer 2018. 
And what we ended up finding is that consistently these downstream stations always had higher DIC levels as compared to the upstream stations. And the higher levels, um, the higher downstream levels were uh, most accentuated during times of low flow uh, during the dry season. So in other words, the increase when you moved from the upstream stations to the downstream stations was, was largest during the dry season as compared to the wet season high flow periods. So I'm, going, I'm showing these uh, similar plots, the same color coding scheme. This is also looking at a time series of our samplings in the rivers. This time we're looking at pH and PCO2. Story is the same here. So as we move from our blue upriver stations to our red downriver stations, we consistently saw decreases in pH in the rivers at those down station, downstream stations. And we consistently saw increases in PCO2 at those downstream stations. Those decreases in pHs and increases in PCO2 were significantly correlated with uh, increased nutrient inputs to the system. And a separate or a concurrent study um, that was led by Cheryl Brown was, was investigating the, the nutrient dynamics specifically in, in the watershed. And as part of that, they were looking at um, sources of nutrients using stable isotopic markers, as well as tracking sources of, um, of microbes using microbial source tracking. And it turns out that the, the places where in this study where we're seeing these increased carbon levels, decreased pH levels, increased PCO2 levels are the same places and times where we see these increases in nutrients, as well as um, evidence of the nutrients being sourced from anthropogenic sources and um, the presence of microbial markers that are indicative of, of human land use. So this is just one example of sort of plotting this, the, um, the relationship between the river chemistry and land use here. So the way this plot works is I have two box plots here, one for the upstream station, one for the downstream station, the arrow connects the medians between the two. And I have them color coded by each of the four rivers here. And so what you see is that as you move from the upstream station to the downstream station in each river, you and you have those decreases in pH and PCO2, you're also always seeing that um, correlating with these increases in anthropogenic land use. So because of the fact that we, we see these um, changes in carbon that are really consistent with multiple metrics of human land use, as well as these um, independent uh, independent metrics related to nutrients and microbes, it seems like at least some portion of these downstream uh, additions of carbon are related in some way to a, to a eutrophication signal uh, in the system. So with that knowledge, I want, we wanted to try to estimate how that impacts the chemistry in the estuary. And so we did this by modeling how much the, the chemistry and the, the ocean end member has changed because of ocean acidification, because of that global increase in atmospheric CO2, and then how much the, the uh, river chemistry entering the bay has been changed because of, of what we're calling this eutrophication signal based upon our actual observations uh, in the system. So I'm gonna walk you through how we estimated each of these changes in the end members and then show you how that impacts the, the chemistry. So we'll start with the ocean side, and we calculated the CN values very similar to the way we did um, up in the Puget Sound study. The difference here is that we corrected those values for the, for the age of the water mass. I'm going to walk you through this slide, but if you take nothing else away from it, just understand that what we did here is that we, we tried to correct the anthropogenic carbon levels coming into the estuary based upon whether or not there was uh, upwelling uh, present. So upwelled waters are older waters by definition and have, were last in contact with an atmosphere that had a lower CO2 level. That means that they would have equilibrated with a lower atmospheric CO2. And so you would expect them to have lower anthropogenic carbon levels than waters that currently are at the surface of our oceans and are equilibrating with modern atmospheric CO2 levels. So this method allows us to vary, to, to have this dynamic uh, anthropogenic carbon value for the ocean end member depending upon whether or not uh, we think there's upwelling or downwelling present. So the way we did that was to use a method uh, that was uh, recently published that tries to correct uh, or estimate the water mass age 
based upon the apparent oxygen utilization and an assumed um, oxygen utilization rate in those waters uh, while, they were, while they were submerged. So I'm going to point out just two examples here to try to, to illustrate how this works. So in the summer of 2017, if you look at the northward wind stress, it, this was a period where there were upwelling favorable winds present. The coastal ocean uh, density that we observed was, was relatively high, and the actual AOU in that coastal ocean end member was also uh, fairly high. So <clears throat> whenever we make these calculations for anthropogenic carbon and, the, and corrected them for the water mass age, the, the water mass age or ventilation age here estimated is relatively high. So at this point here, this is estimating that these waters had been last in contact with the atmosphere approximately 25 or 30 years ago. And so as a result, when we, when we correct our anthropogenic carbon that values, that results in lower anthropogenic carbon values here around uh, approximately 40 micromoles per kilogram. We can contrast that with a time during the winter where we expected more downwelling favorable conditions. Again, this is looking at the, the northward wind stress. At that period, you see um, lower ocean density, but more importantly, is the oxygen levels seem to be relatively equilibrated with the atmosphere. That results in our calculations uh, or the model predicting that the, the ventilation age is very young. So these waters are uh, equilibrated with the modern atmosphere, therefore have taken up a proportionally um, uh, CO2 in proportion with the modern atmosphere, and so re have relatively high anthropogenic carbon values. So again, this red line here is just this dynamic uh, estimate of anthropogenic carbon in the coastal ocean end member as it's entering Tillamook Bay, where during this, the dry seasons where we see quite a bit of upwelling, we're expecting to see lower anthropogenic carbon values, but during the winter, when there's more relaxation, waters are in the surface mixed layer for longer and in contact with the modern atmosphere for longer, they're able to pick up more anthropogenic carbon. So now for the eutrophication side, this is looking at uh, our, how we were able to estimate uh, the impacts to, to the estuary. So it turns out that the downstream enrichments that we were observing were quite predictable based on river discharge. And because the, one of the rivers here is gauged, we were able to use these relationships along with the actual river discharge to estimate time series of inorganic carbon and alkalinity that's being delivered to the estuary because of this, what we're calling this eutrophication signal. So we, we sort of see this as this worst case scenario um, from the eutrophication side, as far as how might the chemistry of these rivers be altered as they enter uh, the bay here because of human activities. And so we can add these two, uh, these two drivers together and look at, start to look at how that impacts bay chemistry. So here I'm looking at the amount of anthropogenic carbon across the salinity spectrum. These dots here represent actual grab samples we had taken during our cruises. And this is estimating the amount of anthropogenic carbon present at those stations when we took these samples. The green is the amount of anthropogenic carbon as a result of the eutrophication watershed um, side. The blue is a result of the acidification signal coming in from the coastal ocean end member. And then the red is the total amount of change. So the, the, the sum of the anthropogenic carbon from the two end members. We did the same thing for the full time series. And you can then look at how that varies through time in the estuary. So this is sort of a spatial representation of the impacts. This is a more temporal um, representation. You can see at the Northern um, station here, most of the anthropogenic carbon is coming from that ocean end member. So the blue line is, is very close to the red line. In other words, the red line representing the, the total change. Little different story at the Southern end, which is much more river influenced. You can see here, especially during the dry season, much of the anthropogenic carbon uh, predicted to be present in the waters here are coming from that eutrophication signal. So we calculated the full carbonate system um, for the estuary. I'm just going to show pH here. So this is, uh, these plots are quantifying the, the pH change estimated to have currently already happened in Tillamook Bay as a result of the acidification in the coastal ocean end member, as well as the local eutrophication signal. Again, for the estuary stations, for the Garibaldi dock, and for the southern TBO1 station. Most of the pH change, especially at this northern station, is being driven by the ocean acidification signal. The, the role of the local eutrophication is, is very small, again, because this is such a marine dominated portion of the estuary. 
Opposite is true at the TBO1, the southern station, where you can see that much of the change in pH is a direct result of that eutrophication signal. But again, the, the ocean acidification signal continues to play a role there. And so this kind of, um, these kind of calculations can then start to inform the, the, the places and the times at which these different drivers are operating to, to impact uh, the pH quite a bit and is going to have um, hopefully help start to inform the relative efficacy of any sort of local management action. So for instance, if, um, if there was interest in some sort of local management action to try to reduce carbon entering the bay, if you were worried about habitats or organisms um, up in the northern end of the bay at the Garibaldi Dock, any sort of local management action may have a relatively minimal impact actually on their water chemistry up there. Most again, most again, most of the change in pH is actually being driven by that global OA signal. The story changes, of course, whenever we get to the, the southern end of the bay where it becomes much more important. But again, the idea here is that we're able to start to make these dynamic um, uh, estimates of how chemistry in the bay has, is being altered by these local versus global uh, drivers. So the, the key takeaways here are that the, the CO2 chemistry in the bay are, are really driven quite a bit by the end members, by what's happening in the coastal ocean, as well as in the watershed. We think there's pretty good evidence that the CO2 chemistry of the rivers that are entering the bay have been influenced by human activities in the watersheds and that the patterns of this elevated CO2 and, and lower pH in the rivers, uh, they match up with known patterns of anthropogenic nutrient enrichment and bacterial contamination. Um, again, whenever we're able to make these estimates of the OA versus eutrophication impacts, that can start to highlight these times and places where the impacts are, are the greatest and can start to get at um, places, if we can attribute these impacts to these local versus global drivers of acidification, we can start to talk about uh, the efficacy of different management uh, actions on different levels and how that will uh, alter in water quality. So help to, to set a bar for um, sort of a, a best case scenario, what could you potentially expect from any given management uh, action? So, uh, running kind of long on time here. So I'm just gonna go through this really quickly. So I wanted to talk about two, um, two things we're continuing with uh, related to coastal acidification at PCEB. So the first is that we're trying to take some of the lessons learned based on these studies um, and scale them up at a, to, a, to a national scale. So the idea here is that we've, we're starting to learn quite a bit, not when I say we, I mean the royal we, the, the field, starting to learn quite a bit about the vulnerability of estuaries to acidification, the drivers that control that, and the role of, of local versus global drivers. And so what we're working on is trying to develop a, na a nationwide ranking of estuaries around the country and how relatively sensitive they are to acidification based upon publicly available data. And so we're, 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 um, we're doing this because there is this a pretty established literature that shows the land use impacts to rivers to, to, to chemistry. Um, these connections are, are pretty well established again between water call quality in a river and, and land use, but it had, I would argue it hasn't been connected super well to the coastal acidification field. And so the idea here is that as um, forecasts like these come out where this is a forecasted uh, DIC export for the Mississippi River out to the end of century, we know that because of our activities um, from the land side of things, that's likely to chemistry, which then is going to have downstream impacts in our areas. And we try to, to get a handle on uh, what are the places around the country that may have most vulnerable to these sorts of things um, because of, of changing activities in, the, in their watersheds. So we're going to be, uh, we're just, this is just getting off the ground now, but the idea again is to try to leverage publicly available data sets here. This is some example of, of two data sets that I've been working with. So this is the USGS data for, for river chemistry. These are some coastal systems that have uh, both alkalinity and pH available to be able to make some estimates of, of um, the sensitivities of those waters to a station. And then this is a, a new coastal ocean product that is an amazing uh, source to, to characterize the CO2 chemistry of, the, of coastal waters that are um, relevant to understand uh, the acidific water. So the idea here is that we can start to put together these, these data that characterize the end members and estuaries across the US and hopefully start to develop um, some, some classification um, 
scheme to try to understand which systems seem to be more and less vulnerable to land of acidific as well as just um, acidification in general. So we'll do this using a lot of the similar calculations that I, I mentioned before. So I'm just gonna kind of quickly go through this. I'm happy to answer any questions about this uh, in the Q&A. So I wanted to end with just mentioning that um, given the audience here that we, we're continuing the, the, the uh, monitoring until this has been gone 27. We continue to, to, or you plan to continue that. We actually are installing a telemetry system there in collaboration with partnership this summer to be able to get some real-time data, then we'll hopefully uh, facilitate more easy sharing of some of this data. The data is also going to this nationwide uh, assessment of acidification monitoring at different national estuary program sites around the country. And working on some pilot studies to try to start integrating some sort of biological metric into our monitoring. So we're getting pretty good at understanding the chemical uh, side of things with regards to what's going on in these systems, but uh, we the challenge remains to really try to connect this to the biology and ecology. What does this really mean for these systems? And I'll close with just a few statements here that estuaries face these really unique suites of, of local and regional acidification drivers, like I'm, I've just shown, all are global atmospheric CO2 increase. So while um, system to system may the vulnerability be highly high. Uh, local land use uh, and the 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 in inherent river chemistry because of of the geology of those watersheds all of these in this atmospheric CO2 increase and we can expect that to become increasingly important into the future. Biological impacts in estuaries due to acidification is are likely going to be uh, some sort of function between the severity of the actual OA changes to the water chemistry and the habitat utilization of the sensitive species and life stages. And helping to consider these the the sort of very non-uniform uh, changes of of estuarine chemistry due to acidification. That's going to help understand us understand the the times and the places where these these organisms may be most vulnerable, as well as where management actions may be most more and less effective. Um, and I think the last point I want to make is this is at the bottom there is just that. I think that there's this continuing need to connect these changes in water quality to biological and ecological impacts. And I don't think I'm alone in, in, in thinking that. So if there's anyone in the community listening that, that is really interested in those same things, I'd love to talk about that, to try to brainstorm some ways to try to, to make some of our monitoring more meaningful uh, from a biological and ecological perspective. So I'll just finish here with my acknowledgement slide. Um, the, the, the work has been a result of many, many successful partnerships that I've, um, I've really enjoyed. And I've been very fortunate to work with all of these great people. So I thank you all. I'm sorry I can't go through you uh, name by name, but I'll close it there and open it up to questions. And again, thank you very much for taking the time to listen today. Thank you very much. Um, so go ahead and put your questions into the chat box um, and I will read them out as they come in. Um, so our first question is, in addition to the EPA data, there are calls for data or collaborations with groups like the Oregon Ocean Monitoring Group to gather data to inform national and statewide um, assessments. Sorry, I missed the very first part of that question. Sure. In addition to the EPA data, are there calls for data or collaborations with other groups that will inform these uh, nationwide or statewide assessments? So I believe the state of Oregon has a call out right now for acidification related data. Um, so, yes. <laughs> uh, Liz, do you have an additional question? Uh, let me know, and or if that didn't get to it, um, I can unmute you. Uh, so is that through DEQ and not EPA, correct? That is correct, yes. Okay. Um, so I have just a really detailed question, and so as folks are typing in their questions, I can um, kind of ask my selfish question. Um, in Tillamook, you had talked about anthropogenic metrics, and uh, over the course of the river, you were seeing increases in anthropogenic metrics. What were those metrics? So um, there's one was just looking at um, land use cover and actually breaking that down by the sort of the sub watersheds that are specific to each of our um, each of our stations. We had um, Pat Clinton, our, our past resident GIS 
expert calculate those for us for each of our stations. So we were able to look at the, the land use in each of the watershed specific to the station. Um, there's also the, the uh, Sparrow model, which is a, a large model that um, Cheryl Brown collaborated with um, folks at USGS to get results from that are specific to our study sites in Tillamook. And that, that uh, predicts the proportion of, of natural and anthropogenic sources of nutrients to specific locations, those specific locations being, again, our study sites. So um, I didn't want to go too deep into that, but that is also <laughs> um, helpful for us. So I think uh, the, the last thing I'd say there is just, I think the power of the study is that I think it's so difficult with the, the many um, sort of correlations between all these different metrics to really get at um, causation and not correlation. And I think a power of the study that we had, uh, we had, we've had up there is that we've been measuring a lot of uh, relatively independent things using isotopic markers, using uh, microbial source tracking. And I think that's helped build this sort of weight of evidence um, approach to try to understand uh, what's going on in the system up there. Great, thank you for going down the rabbit hole with me a little bit. I was just curious. Um, so we have another qu question from Mitch. Um, he says, sorry if I missed it, but are the base sensors near the bottom, near the surface? Um, are they mobile? Can you talk a little bit more about sensor and sensor placement? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so both of them are fixed. Um, the Garibaldi dock one, so that is the, the, the northern end that's much more ocean influenced. That's about a meter and a half off the bottom, I believe, at a fixed that's fixed. And then uh, at the southern end, it is, we have it basically strapped on to a, a derelict docked down there, again, fixed. Um, it is very close to the bottom because it goes so shallow there, depending upon what the tides are doing. Um, it's, it's, quite, it's quite close to the bottom there, let's say 15 centimeters or so. Great. Um, so another question. Um, first of all, thanks. Great talk, Steve. Um, have you looked into the trends of alkalinity increases in the river and um, extend that to um, and the extent that they might delay the full impacts of OA, at least for a while? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so one of the points I, I hope I made is that this, these changes in the rivers are always resulting in lower pH, higher CO2, lower omega despite the fact that, that there is an increase in alkalinity export. Um, and that's because of a lot of the carbon that's coming out is coming out as bicarbonate. Um, but what ends up happening is it, it, I haven't modeled forward, so I can't directly answer the question of how, how in time, how does it delay things? What happens though, is you end up uh, in every estuary, you sort of have this zone of salinity where you expect to see the most um, drastic changes in, in pH, it's usually called the, the what, maximum estuary acidification zone. And what happens is with this, these changes in the river inputs, you end up shifting that around the estuary um, seasonally. So basically the salinities that um, become, are most sensitive end up uh, changing depending upon season because of those um, changes in, uh, in that eutrophication signal. Great, thank you. Um, let's see. I lost the questions. We had some, let's see. Um, as a follow-up, um, can we, might we, should we manage watershed alkalinity export as a tool? Um, I, I think it should be looked at. I mean, that's one of the, that's one of the questions right now I have and in, in this um, moving into this sort of more national assessment, big picture question. Uh, to be completely honest, I've tried to avoid the uh, alkalinity uh, issue in rivers because it's so complex, but uh, it's something we're going to be looking into a little bit. It's possible that that could, that could be um, one of the tools in, in, in the toolbox. I, I will point out though that, you know, that what we saw in Tillamook is not true for everywhere in the US. There are plenty of places actually you can look at in the US where you see an increase in alkalinity um, through time. So it's, it's pretty complicated. Um, so one more question here, we're almost out of time, but I'll throw this one in there. Of the anthropogenic sources of carbon from the Tillamook watershed, do you have a sense of which uses um, are contributing the most? 
So ag versus urban? Uh, the short answer is no. The longer answer is we have a lot of data and we're really interested in trying to learn more about that. But no, the, the data I have right now is unable to, to tease it out at that level, so. All right, and I think with that, we will say thank you so very, very much for sharing with us um, and uh, all the work. I know this was a huge project and many, many uh, participants were involved in it. So thank you very much. Um, for everybody online, thank you so much for joining us. I hope to see you um, at Science on Tap next week on Wednesday or at our seminar next Thursday. So thank you for spending your afternoon with us um, and we'll see you again. And Steve, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. All right, everyone, I'm gonna end the presentation now and we'll see you again. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Steve. Thank you very much.